Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Brazos Valley, or Brazos UU for short. My name is Darby, and I'm serving as your worship assistant today. I come to this church because I believe that Unitarian Universalism can save the world, and I believe that we should all support things that endeavor to great things. We are a welcoming congregation, which means that we celebrate and welcome all people of diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. We also strive to welcome people across diversities of race, age, ability, immigration status, and belief. We're also a congregation working for reproductive justice. So whoever you are, wherever you have come from, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We encourage everyone to visit our website, brazos-uu.org. During this time of pandemic and in the midst of our planned building project, the website and our weekly services are our church home. If you might like to contribute your musical talents, if you have a great story to share about your life's journey, or if you have a passion for social justice, we would love to hear from you. If you're interested in getting involved, you can find opportunities on our website. To learn more about our community and what is happening, you can join our email list and our monthly newsletter, and you can find us on social media by searching UUCBV. To talk of freedom for women without the ballot is a mockery. What is this ballot? Gentlemen, what does your vote mean? What does the right to say to every possible man native and foreign, black and white, rich and poor, educated and ignorant, drunk and sober, to every possible man outside of state prison, the idiot and lunatic asylums, it says, your opinion is worthy to be counted. That is what it says under the shadow of the American flag. What does it say to every possible woman, native and foreign, white and black, rich and poor, educated and ignorant, virtuous and vicious, to every possible woman under the flag, it says your judgment is not sound. Your opinion is not worthy to be counted. This fact that every possible man's opinion, the moment he arrives at the age of 21, is thus respected and thus counted, educates all men into the knowledge that they possess the political authority of every other man. The poorest ditch digger's opinion counts one and the same as the millionaires. It is right. I believe in it. I would not take from the most ignorant man the right to vote. It gives him self-respect and self-protection. We cannot rise in rebellion as men do, but we will stand and plead and demand the right to be heard and have our votes counted until the crack of doom if necessary. I invite you to light your own chalice, if you have one, as I light our chalice today. Please say our chalice lighting words with me. We light the chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, as a beacon of hope for all who seek justice, dignity, and compassion, and in celebration of the life of truth and meaning we share together. Now all please join me in saying our affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another.
Wake now my senses and hear the earth call Feel the deep power Wake now my reason, reach out to the new, join with each pilgrim who quests for the true, honor the beauty and wisdom of time, suffer thy limit and praise the sublime. Wake now Suffering fill the wide sky Take as your neighbor Both stranger and friend Praying and striving Their hardship to end Wake now my conscience With justice thy guide Join with all Rights are denied. Take not for granted a privileged place. God's love embraces the whole human race. Wake now, my vision of ministry clear. Brighten. Our time for all ages this week is called the Bundle of Sticks, and it's adapted from a fable of Aesop's. Once upon a time, an old woman lived on a beautiful farm in the country. From her window, she could see pasture land, fields of grain, barns filled with animals, orchards, and forests beyond. The farm was special to the old woman because it had been in her family for many generations. She had lived there her whole life, and there she also raised her large family. Now, she was in the last days of her life. The old woman should have been content after such a fortunate life, but she was not. She lay on her bed worrying about her grown children. They could not seem to get along. She heard them quarreling day and night. Even though some of them are good at farming and some at working with animals, some at carpentry, and others at cooking or preserving the food they grew, they each thought that their job was the most important and that the others didn't work hard enough. They were all grown-ups now, but they held grudges against each other from things in the past, and they were jealous of each other's good fortune. The old woman tried talking to her children about living in peace, yet they seemed to grow increasingly bitter by the day. She felt sure that they would not be able to keep the family farm after she died because they could not seem to work together or to appreciate each other's gifts. Then one day, as her strength waned, she had an idea. She called her children to her bedside. I have one last favor to ask of you, she said. I would like each one of you to go to the forest and find two sticks. Bring them here tomorrow and I will explain. 
The children did as she asked and came to her room the next day with two sticks each. Thank you, children, the old woman said. Please put one of your sticks down and see if you can break the other in half. The children easily broke their sticks in half. Then the old woman asked the children to pass her the remaining whole sticks. Let us gather the remaining sticks into a bundle, she said. Then the old woman passed the bundle back to her children and said, please pass this bundle of sticks amongst you and tell me, is it easy, is it as easy to break the bundle as it was the single stick? The children passed the bundle amongst them, but none of them could break the bundle of sticks. You, my children, are like these sticks, the old woman said. If you go your separate ways, quarreling and holding resentments toward one another, you will each be alone, like the individual sticks. The difficulties of life will easily hurt you. But if you work together, appreciate each other's strengths, cherish what you have in common, and care for each other, you will be strong like the bundle of sticks, and nothing in life can break you. Find strength and joy in one another's company, and you will live well and accomplish much. The children took their mother's lesson to heart, letting go of past grudges, focusing on what they shared in common, appreciating each other's strengths, and working together. The old woman died peacefully, and the farm remained in the family for many generations. The end. I'll leave you today with the moral of Aesop's fable. In unity is strength. Thank you.
History by Linda Hogan. This is the word that is always bleeding. You didn't think this until your country changes, and when it thunders, you search your own body for a missing hand or leg. In one country, there are no bodies shown. Lies are told, and they keep hidden the weeping children on dusty streets. But I do remember once, a woman and a child in beautiful blue clothing, walking over a dune, spreading a green cloth, drinking nectar with mint and laughing. Beneath a sky of clouds from the river, near the true Garden of Eden. Now another country is breaking this holy vessel, where stone has old stories, and the fire creates clarity in the eyes of a child, who will turn it into hate one day. We are so used to it now, this country where we do not love enough, that country where they do not love enough, and that. We do not need a God by any name, nor do we need to fall to our knees or cover ourselves, enter a church or a river. Only do we need to remember what we do to one another. It is so fierce. What any of our fathers may do to a child, what any of our brothers or sisters do to non-believers, how we try to discover who is guilty by becoming guilty, because history has continued to open the veins of the world more and more, always in its search for something gold. Bright morning stars are rising Bright morning stars are rising Bright morning stars are rising Day is breaking in my soul Oh, where are our dear mothers? Oh, where are our dear mothers? Oh, where are our dear mothers? Day is breaking in my soul. Oh, where are our dear fathers? Oh, where are our dear fathers? Oh, where are our dear fathers? Day is a breaking in my soul. They are in the fields of plowing. They are in the fields of plowing. They are in the fields of plowing. Day is a breaking in my soul. They are sowing seeds of gladness. They are sowing seeds of gladness. They are sowing seeds of gladness. Day is a breaking in my soul. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Day is breaking in my soul. Hello, I'm Pastor Kai Hartwood, and I'm talking to you this morning about early universalist ministers, two women universalist ministers who came to Texas in the 1880s.
Her name was Mary Charlotte Ward Granis Webster Billings. She was married three times. She grew up in Connecticut. And she was the first woman ordained in Texas. She was ordained in 1892 when she was 68 years old. And I look forward to telling you her story. Mary C. was born in Litchfield, Connecticut, which was a city. It was the biggest city in Connecticut at the time. In 1825, she was born the 14th of 16 children. She was educated in Litchfield. Litchfield was unusual in that it had an early law school and it also had a center for women's education when people were still wondering if it would hurt our brains or hurt our wombs to get be educated. So her older brother Henry uh, converted to universalism. Mary C.'s mother and herself also became universalist very early on. And she took to writing. When she married her first husband in her 20s, he was named Granis. His last name was Granis, and he was a silk merchant. They built a beautiful house. It had a name. The house had a name, Elizabeth's Rest. And they lived there, and they went to Europe on the great tour. And she sent back articles about, about it that you can still read if you look it up on Google. But she started writing hymns. She got involved in the Universalist Church she was published, her hymns were published, and this progressed on. Her first husband died fairly young, and she was widowed early, and they didn't have any children. Then she married her second husband, who was the Universalist minister. He was also a chaplain in the Civil War, and he uh, was named Webster, and he was a missionary to Connecticut, which is sort of like an oxymoron, but about this time, what was going on in universalism, and maybe you don't know what universalists believe, but universalists believe in universal salvation. That means everybody's going to be saved. There's no hell. There's no belief in original sin. Later on, the universalists start getting more involved in world religions and having more sources. But they're basically think of them as like the early Christians before the fourth century. So very optimistic people, open-minded people. This is a place where lots of self-employed people and of uh, people of many classes, and is the earliest American church to be interested in women's rights and letting women preach. Now the Universalists get very involved right around the Civil War like Unitarians did as well, with raising money for the Sanitary Commission, which becomes the Red Cross. So a lot of women got their first taste of being involved in public events and public issues by working for the Sanitary Commission and organizing benefits for the centenary of John Murray's arrival in America. And Mary Billings gets involved in that. So she goes from being kind of privileged, wealthy. Mary gets invited to Phoebe Hannaford's church to give her first sermon. Now, she's still a lay person at this point, but she preaches and she likes it. And she's very involved in the organizing of these, of these women's groups. And she's a secretary for it. And she's really good with money. And she's... Um, an excellent writer, and she's actually well-known, so respected, very proper woman. And her second husband dies. His, he had a bookstore in, in Hartford after he was a minister, and so they were very literary. They were very hooked up. They knew all the people, and she's starting to meet all the famous women ministers and meets Julia Ward Howe. So after the Civil War, there's lots of activity. A lot of these women were involved in abolition, and they get involved in early feminist projects. So that's what's going on with her. She meets a man named Reverend Billings. Now, Reverend Billings had had a number of churches in Michigan, but he is elected by the, uh, the Universalist Association to go as a missionary to Texas. Now, Mary is 61 at this point. She's been widowed twice. She's a well-known writer, and uh, this is where it starts getting, the story gets very Texas. This event happens in Waco on March 30th. Reverend James Billings, an evangelist of the General Conference of the Universalist Church, 
preach two sermons here today in Liberal Hall, which is the headquarters of the free thought agnostic element headed by ex-Reverend J.D. Shaw. At the close of Mr. Billings' sermon tonight, he quietly stepped down from the pulpit, walked to a lady in the audience, Mrs. Mary C. Webster, and the two taking a position before the lectern stand were made husband and wife by Mr. Shaw. The lady came all the way from Hartford, Connecticut, which is her home, to meet Reverend Billings in Waco and marry him. She is the widow of a noted Universalist preacher and has herself received some reputation in the East as a lecturer. The couple have both reached mature years. Yes, that's from 1885. And in 1892, after they have raised the money and built a church, a Universalist Center Church in Heiko, Texas, which was at the end of the about 75 miles south of Dallas, it was a cotton town. They had the Universalist Conference there in 1892, and Reverend Billings uh, ordained Mary. And that is the first time a woman's been ordained in Texas. So she is kind of holding down the fort in Heiko and running services there. She's lending everybody money at 10% interest and sometimes foreclosing. And so she's paid for the church. He's preaching all over the place. Her husband, Reverend Billings, dies. So for six years after that, she is the main minister in Texas for universalism. And she's writing to the other women ministers who are spread out. There's six or seven spread out all over Texas, including who I'll talk about later. They have their uh, conferences, kind of like our General Assembly. And she's taken all the notes. When I went to Harvard to do research on this paper, I got to hold the books, and it was her handwriting and her songs, and everything's in there. Well, everything's going along, and she has a woman move in with her that uh, is her companion. And Mary dies in her companion's arms in 1904, very suddenly, with nobody set to keep the church going, nobody uh, in place that understands everything that they had going on. And by 1929, there wasn't anything universalist, and now that church is owned by the Catholic Church. And what can we learn about Mary? We have a lot of people in our church who are extremely adept and are running lots of things, are used to being in leadership. And what I would say is the cautionary tale about Mary. Mary Ward Granis Webster Billings is prepare for when you're not here. Make sure that other people know how everything works. We all have limited time on the planet and none of us know how long it's going to be. It's a cautionary tale in lots of respects, but it's good to know about these people and it's good to realize that history doesn't always move in a straight line. There's progress and then sometimes there's back sets and things look more jagged. The edge is much more saw-like than a curve or a nice incline. The next person I want to talk is probably the youngest woman ordained in the 1870s. She, um, she was unmarried at the time, and she had grown up a Quaker, a Hicksite Quaker. So that's an abolitionist Quaker. Hicksites uh, follow Eliza Hicks. And they, they did not believe in, uh, the Bible was the only source. They have a lot in common with Unitarians. Our present day beliefs are real similar to the Hicksite Quakers. Um, they are the most liberal of the Quaker branches. And these people were living in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, when Marianna was born. Her name is Reverend Marianna Thompson Folsom. But she's born to a Quaker family. They're kind of a lower middle class. Her father, uh, Samuel, he sells Wedgwood China, Queensware, which was designed by Francis Wedgwood in England. He was an abolitionist. Another way to say, hey, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm supporting abolitionists. And they were often main backbones of the Underground Railroad. So that's the family that she was born in. She is the eldest. Later, there would be six other siblings. They didn't have a lot of money. And they are very sincere about women being educated. 
In the Quaker church, there were women ministers. And Marianna's going to get to grow up with a very famous one. Marianna's family decides to move right before the Civil War. And they're moving out to Iowa to a place called Mount Pleasant, which has a school, Wesleyan College, which is letting women and blacks in. This is revolutionary. And they really want Marianna to get an education. And she wants to get an education. She's having her teenage years in Mount Pleasant, and there's a famous minister who moves there named Joseph Dugdale. He's, he's a famous abolitionist, and his mother, Sarah, is a minister. They know her. She's 17, and she's around all these heady people, and everybody v- visits them. They know everybody. They know Susan B. Anthony. They know Mary Livermore. They know, um, they know Elizabeth Cady Stanton. They know Frederick Douglass. So imagine growing up in that kind of environment where these people are coming over for dinner when they're lecturing on the Lyceum Circuit, which is what they called it. It was the TED Talk of that era. And that that town of Mount Pleasant is a college town on the frontier with a lot of feminists and a lot of abolitionists, maybe six sites on on the Underground Railroad. People are coming through all the time. People are talking on the Lyceum circuit at the opera house. They have an opera house. Everybody's coming to visit from Mark Twain to, you know, Mary Livermore, who, who made a, quite a reputation on the Lyceum circuit, as well as helping her husband, Daniel, run the New Covenant newspaper. So that's the kind of environment Marianna's growing up in. And she's smart, and she's going to go to college. So her plan is to go to school right where she grew up. But something happens. She meets Mary Livermore. She finds out about Olympia Brown. She finds out about Phoebe Hannaford that both went to school at at Lawrence, St. Lawrence in New York. And suddenly the money is there somehow. I think it's Mary Livermore that raised the money for her. But she went to school at St. Lawrence to be a minister. Every school break, she is out preaching and guest preaching and raising money for her school. And they're writing about it in the New Covenant. And she's really good at preaching. Her opportunities for ministry were very limited. It's a miracle she got to graduate from school, and she's not wealthy. Everybody's trying to help her. So she graduates in 1870, and there's an article in the paper that goes on, it's kind of like USA Today kind of thing, where there's a front page and there's like short write-ups about everybody's life or cool things that happened, you know, kind of People Magazine, little short things. Well, all over the U.S., it was published because Olympia Brown and Mary Livermore, who were famous people, put a story in that Marianna had been offered two churches for $1,200 a year, which is a huge salary. Now, I did all the research I could, and I cannot find any proof that they actually offered her these jobs. But she did get an interim job where she was going to to preach while somebody was on sabbatical for four or five months in Michigan. She did that job, and she was in the pulpit there and getting paid to be there. Um, This is before she's even married. And a very young woman named Anna Shaw Howard saw her preach and got advice from her. And later, Anna Shaw Howard becomes the president after Susan B. Anthony of the NWSA. So Uh, Anna Shaw Howard is the first woman ordained in the Methodist Church, the first American woman. Now, she had been really involved in women's suffrage early on in Iowa when she was growing up. And she goes back to that because here's the thing. Women ministers can't get paid. If they even get a church, uh, they're not getting paid very much, and certainly not as much as a male minister, and male ministers are not getting paid very much. She's doing pretty good to even get assigned a church, so she's not really making much money. She marries uh, another student who is the son of a universalist minister named Alan Folsom. Alan Folsom gets a couple of churches, and Mariana, when she's got the children, they start having children, she's serving a church as the minister of small churches around her husband's church. She's the preacher's wife, 
and she's got three, three small children. So that's what's going on. He actually doesn't like being a minister. So he get, moves the family out to Iowa. They move back to Iowa where it's easier for Mariana to get a church because it's still the frontier. And he starts selling Wedgwood China too. She takes the job with the Iowa Suffragette Association. She meets Julia Ward Howe. She's hanging out with all these heady feminists. She's met everybody. She's writing letters. Um, in her papers are letters to Susan B. Anthony, to Alice Stone, to everybody that was involved in suffrage. She's very involved. And she's a speaker. She's using her preacher skills to do the stump, do the lyceum, but she's, you know, not famous. She's not getting paid as much, but she's out in the weeds preaching. And she goes in 1881 to Texas to do a uh, lecture circuit. She goes to Texas. She does 60 lectures uh, following the railroad, uh, going to any town that she can get to. She doesn't have enough money for a, a wagon or a buggy, but she basically standing on on the the train railing talking to the cowboys who are in, in the mud. And then sometimes she goes back and they bring their wives. Every year she goes out and she does lectures as far as the train has now gotten to. And she is preaching suffrage and she's making a, the money that the, her family lives on pretty much from that because her husband gets sick. Her and her husband are eventually separate but they never get divorced. Toward her later years, she lived in Austin, and she worked with the legislatures, educating the legislatures. So she'd go up to Capitol Hill every day and try and get them to pass women's suffrage in Texas. She's writing letters at this point in the suffragette movement when the 15th Amendment passes the Constitution that gives uh, black male men the right to vote, but not women and specifically says that suffrage splits between Lucy Stone's group, the American Women's Suffrage Association, and the National Women's Suff Suffrage Association. And she's doing the sloggy work of talking to the cowboys and trying to get the legislatures educated enough and supportive enough and trying to get the two women's suffrage groups to invest in Texas. She almost single-handedly does this. And because she dies in 1909 and never sees suffrage happen, she never gets the credit that she is due for making Texas the first state in the South to ratify women's suffrage, the 19th Amendment. She was a minister who expanded her ministry. Every time she found a block, she expanded it. She's a, a social gospel believing seven day a week minister. She's out in the streets getting women the right to vote. But there is not a photograph of her. I've not found one. Nobody else has found one. And her papers, along with her daughters, are in the Texas archives. So if you want, want to go look, they're digital, and you can look at some of the stuff they did. She sent $600 to Mary Billings for the Universalist Church. So they knew each other. They were aware. There's some correspondence between the two even though there's about 20 years difference in their ages. But what I want to say to you as activist people who are doing the work day to day is I want you to know that you can't, you can't know what the influence is of the work that you're doing day in, day out. If you never get credit for the work you did, it doesn't mean that it wasn't valuable and necessary and you did make a difference. Mariana Thompson Folsom is an excellent example of that. Take heart. Thank you for listening. If we were having worship service in person, this is a time when we would pass the basket. This church shares the proceeds of the offering plate donation every week to support the important nonprofit organizations with which we work. This month, we are proud to support the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, UUSC, starting in October through December. The UUSC is a nonprofit, nonsectarian associate member organization 
of the Unitarian Universalist Association that works to provide disaster relief and promote human rights and social justice around the world. If you wish to make an offering, you can mail your check or for your convenience, you can donate online on our homepage at brazos-uu.org. You can find our mailing address at the bottom and at the top, you'll see a Donate Here link. In the chat box, you will see that link now. Please be as generous as you can. May each of us look into our hearts. How much love, how much generosity, how much faith, how much gratitude, how much hope is there? We give thanks for these gifts we have given, for those we receive, and for each other. Blessed be. Everybody is wondering what and where they all came from. Everybody is worried about where they're going to go when the whole thing's done. Now please join me in extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we gather together again. <laughs>